What does it say about who we are? We have male bodies and female bodies. What does your body say about who you are? And you are immaterial, and God judges not by the outer appearance of your body, but by the inward disposition of your heart. New City. My name is John Homas. I'm the lead pastor here. So grateful to be with you and going through this series on our bodies. Uh, Nat teased me this morning. Nat, who's leading the Jude Bible study, he said, you should have given us like a six-month warning before we started the series so we could all get in shape (laughs) so that we feel a little better about ourselves going into this series. Um, But last week, we kicked off this series, Following Jesus with Our Bodies. We talked about how our bodies are both beautiful and broken. We are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of our creator. Our bodies are created, but our bodies have also been invaded by sin. Our our bodies have a corrosive force in them called sin. And sin is not just the bad things we do. It is really an invader in God's world because of Adam and Eve's rebellion that causes our bodies to break down and ultimately die. Uh, But our bodies do have a redeemer. As Christians, we can think that Christianity has more to do with our spirit or soul, but that's not the promise of Scripture. The promise is that our bodies will one one day be resurrected and redeemed. And so that's what we talked about last week. But today, we are going to talk about uh, our body and identity. Our body and our identity and what our bodies say about who we are. Now, even as you probably read that title, you're thinking a lot of different things. Our culture's talking about this, not in just one way, but in a lot of different ways. And today we're going to get into the scriptures and see what God says. But let me pray first. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would help us follow you with our bodies today. We pray that you would open up our minds and change our hearts and where our perspectives need to be challenged, would you challenge them? But where, our, where we need comfort, we pray that you would comfort us. Might we see you more clearly through the scriptures today. In your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. We're going to read a bunch of different scriptures. They're on the slides for you, but we're going to start off In Genesis 1, such a crucial passage for us. We'll probably read it every week. Genesis 1 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and the livestock and the whole earth and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Say very good. First Peter 3, Peter writes, Don't let your beauty consist of outward things like elaborate hairstyles and wearing gold jewelry or fine clothes, but rather what is inside the heart, the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. First Samuel 16, Talking about Saul, the Lord says to Samuel, Do not look at his, Saul's appearance or his stature, because I have rejected him. Humans do not see what the Lord sees, for humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. 1 Corinthians 16, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price, so glorify God with your what? With your body. The words of Jesus from Matthew, Jesus says, don't fear those who can kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In chapter 15, Jesus says, But what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and this defiles a person. For from the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies, and slander. 
And then our last scripture passage from today comes from 1 Thessalonians 5, where Paul writes, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. There's a lot in there. When we talk about the idea of what our bodies say about who we are, it is a question of identity. What does your body say about who you are? We have fit bodies. We have aging bodies. We have attractive bodies. What does our body say about who we are? We have black bodies, brown bodies, and white bodies. What does it say about who we are? We have male bodies and female bodies. What does your body say about who you are? This is a question that we have. This is a question that our culture is asking. This is a question that shows up in everything, even movies. In the 2009 movie Avatar, did anyone see the movie Avatar 2009? In the movie uh, Avatar that came out in 2009, it was a blockbuster hit. The main character there on your right was a guy named Jake Sully who had a disability. He was not able to walk. And the movie was set far in the future on a planet far away from Earth where humans have moved to colonize this mineral. And there were these alien creatures called the Navi. And you'll see those are the blue guys up there. And Jake Sully was allowed to leave his body and inhabit one of the Navi's body. And when he was in that body, he was bigger, stronger, and faster. And the goal in putting him in the body of that blue species was that he would infiltrate them and then they would be able to use him as an insider to colonize them and get minerals from them. But as Jake Sully, now in this new body, as he's part of this new people, he begins to identify less with humans and more with the Navi. He likes the fact that he's bigger, stronger, and faster in this blue body. These creatures were like double the size of humans. But then he also begins to identify with their culture as he lives in this body. His perspective begins to change and he becomes more at home as a Navi than he does as a human. And what's interesting in this movie is sort of the high point, like the moment of salvation almost, is when he permanently gets to leave his human body and solidify that he is now going to live in the blue body of the Navi. And he's going to be able to walk and run and live among them. And it's interesting to think about like what that is saying about how we view our bodies. Where Jake's identity throughout the movie begins to change from seeing himself as human to seeing himself as Navi. What what does your body say about who you are? This is a question of identity. Do, Do we, like Jake Sully, have this sense that we're someone different than our body says that we are, and we would be better suited in a different kind of body, or if there were changes made to our body? What does your body say about who you are is a question of identity. But as followers of Jesus... We have to use God as a reference point when we answer that question. The question can't just be, what does God say about our bodies? What do our bodies say about who we are? But rather, what does God say about our bodies? And therefore, who are we according to what God says about our bodies? There are three truths that we can pull out of the scripture passages that we looked out today. The first truth is this. God sees more than your body. God sees more than your body. You you are more than a physical body. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, and he talks about a spirit, a soul, and a body. Now, there's a debate in theology whether there is three parts to every human 
or whether there's two parts, whether the three parts are spirit, soul, and body, or whether it's just sort of immaterial and material, spiritual and physical. We're not going to get into all that today, but the idea is there's more than just this. There's more than skin. There's, there's more than a skeleton. There's more than muscles. There's more than tissues. There is an, an immaterial part of you, and God has created you that way. You have a soul. That's what Jesus teaches in Matthew 10. He talks about the immaterial part of you. And he says that this immaterial part of you is important. Don't be afraid of what someone can do to your body. Be afraid of what God can do to your soul and your body. Now, now we could get into the whole idea that Jesus didn't teach about hell, but that's for another day. What Jesus is trying to get across and what's helpful for us is that there are two parts of every human. You are not just a body, you are a body and a soul. You are material and you are immaterial. And God judges not by the outer appearance of your body, but by the inward disposition of your heart. That's what the prophet is told by God when Saul is chosen as king. If you remember the story, the people choose Saul as king because he's tall, dark, and handsome. And they said, that's our guy. He looks good. He speaks good. Let's choose him as our king. But not so with the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, humans do not see what the Lord sees, for humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. It's not just that the Lord sees what's inside, but the Lord, God, our God, is looking for hearts that want to obey him. And Saul's heart was not that way. If you continue to read through First and Second Samuel, you'll see that the, that the Lord judges Saul for not obeying him. But he chooses David, who has a humble heart before him, because God sees beyond outward appearances. Our God is someone who sees beyond the appearance of, of our body, to the immaterial part of us, to the inward part of us, to the heart. That's why Peter gives these instructions in 1 Peter chapter 3. He says, don't let your beauty consist of outward things like elaborate hairstyles and wearing gold jewelry or fine clothes, but rather what is inside the heart, the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in what? God's sight. Now, Peter is not condemning being attractive and beautiful. He's not actually saying, don't ever wear jewelry. That's not the point. The point of what what was happening in his culture was this idea of ostentatiousness. That's a big word that we don't really use much, but what it means is that people were being elaborate and showy with the way that they appeared, with the way that they dressed in order to get attention. And what Peter is saying is, that's not what is important to God. What's important to God is not outward beauty, but inward beauty. What's important to God is how you look on the inside, that you're gentle and quiet before him, which is of great worth in his sight. Now, maybe there's some room for us to wrestle in South Florida, man, because we like to get glitzy. We like to get glammy down here. And, and, and maybe there's a fun aspect of that, but we need to ask the question around identity. Uh, are we how we present ourselves to the world, or are we who God sees us to be? Are we our outward appearance, or are we who we are in our heart before God? See, if God sees more than the appearance of our bodies, Maybe we focus too much on how we appear. Not just with fashion, but maybe how we appear on social media. How many times do we take the picture before we put it out so that we appear perfect on our social media? Or even with fitness. Like fitness is a great thing. I I try, I try, I try to stay in shape. Being physically active and physically fit is a good thing. But sometimes it can become like an obsession. It becomes like an identity. And sometimes that obsession, that identity can be because we want the watching world to see something about who we are and how we present in our bodies. And physical fitness is not bad, but sometimes 
good things can become ultimate things in our life because we've made them things that are about our identity. And we've forgotten the inward part of us. We've forgotten what it means to have the Lord see who we are. We spend so much time on getting our bodies to present the right way to the outward world that we forgot to work on our spirits before the Lord. We forget to work on our hearts before the Lord. God sees much more than the appearance of our bodies. But maybe that can not just be about us, maybe that can affect how we think about other people as well. Sometimes we are drawn to befriend people simply by the way they look. If someone looks good, if they look like a winner, we can move towards them just simply because of the way they appear. And it's possible that we're missing deep friendships with beautiful people because we've judged them by how they appear on the outside and never actually taken the time to get to know them on the inside. But not only that, maybe, maybe for those of you who are looking to get married, maybe there's a word of wisdom there. Have you written off potential future spouses because they don't fit the category of how you think they should look? Have you taken the time to to actually get to know someone's heart before you decide if they're right for you? I mean, one of the most attractive things to me about my wife is the fact that she suffers well. I've said this before. She walks through suffering with such Loyalty, and she has to walk through suffering because she's married to me. But (laughs) as much as I I find her beautiful, that's one of the things on the inside that I just love about who she is. And she walks through suffering so well. God sees more than the outward appearance of our bodies. God sees the heart. At the same time, God gave you life in your body. Like the body's not unimportant. When we say God sees more than your body, we're not saying the body doesn't matter because God chose us to have life in these bodies that we have. Your your life is not separate from your body. Right now in our culture, just like in the movie Avatar, we're sort of wrestling with this idea that there's our body and then there's our true self. There's our authentic self. There's someone deeper than our body. There's there's this true person in there, and we choose to uh, disconnect our identity from our body. Just like in the movie Avatar, this idea that he didn't fit in his body and he was better suited in the body of, of a Navi. Well, God made our bodies. God gave you your body. And he made our bodies good, but not just good, very good. We were chosen to bear God's image in the world, not by being spirits floating around in the middle of nowhere, but by having physical bodies. In Genesis 1, over and over, we went through this last week, God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. He gave them bodies. God saw all that he had made, and it was what? Very good indeed. When God made Adam, he did not make a spirit first and then make a body to house that spirit. He made Adam's body first. And then he breathed life into him. So this idea that we're this authentic self that doesn't match up with our body doesn't fit with the creation story where God has given us physical bodies that have great dignity and honor. And he has given it these bodies so that we might reflect who he is in the world. In fact, this idea of being separated from our body, this idea that there's this true self in us that's not our bodies, the only time that we actually see that in Scripture is death. When we die, we are separated from our bodies, and it is treated as an awful thing that was never meant to be part of God's creation, but is rather part of the curse of sin. That was the warning to Adam and Eve. Eat from any tree, but if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you will surely die. Soul and body will be separated. Too often we see our bodies as bad when God says they're very good. But not only that, 
we see our heart as something to be trusted when God says, watch out for what comes out of your heart. Jesus in Matthew 15 warns against trusting the heart. He says, what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and this is what defiles a person. For from the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies, and slander. There's a radical self-orientation that has happened in our hearts. Our hearts are about us. And Jesus says, listen, you, you have to be careful what comes out of your heart, your true self. As sinners, we are corrupt to the core. If, if we sat down and shared everything that came out of our heart, we would all be terribly embarrassed of our thoughts and our passions and the things that we dwell on. And so this idea that our bodies are bad, but our hearts, our true self, are good, it's the exact opposite in Scripture. Our, our, our bodies were created very good, but because of sin, our hearts are fallen. God made our bodies good, and God gave you life in your body so that your body is not just some possession you have like a car. It's not just some receptacle that you have. It is you it is what God created you to bear his image in. Sam Alberry puts it this way. He says, our body is not an accessory to who we are. It is part of who we are. We can't properly understand who we are apart from our body. Your body is not other than you. It is not just a receptacle for you. It is you. In the Bible, it's not just that you have a body. You are a body. You are a body. A body that's been made very good. And if we are our bodies, we have to think about how we think about things. Here's what I mean. When we think about sex as a culture, we think that sex is just for our bodies, but we can keep our souls out of it. So, I'm, I'm able to engage in sexual relationships, but I don't have to put everything in it because my soul is separate from who my body is. The authentic me can, can sort of stay away from this, this passion, this, this sexual release that our bodies go through. And so it's okay to sleep with whoever I want to sleep with because it doesn't affect my soul. That's what our culture thinks. But here's the funny thing. That's what the men in Corinth thought. Paul addresses them because these Christian men were going to a temple and they were visiting prostitutes and they were having sexual relationships with them and they were saying, the body, whatever, it's separate from who I am. My soul knows Jesus and that's what's important. And Paul says, no, man, that's not how it works. Your body and your soul are connected. They are who you are. And so Paul says, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. What Paul is saying is there's, there's nothing deeper when it comes to sin than sexual sin. Now, you might say, okay, hold on, hold on. Uh, what about drug addiction? Doesn't drug addiction affect your body? Absolutely. Doesn't alcoholism or even like addiction to rage, doesn't that affect your body? Absolutely. But there is something about sexuality where our soul and our body are so connected that we open ourselves up to something so deep when we sleep with someone who is not our spouse. I mean, you know this. If you have slept with someone who is not your spouse, or once you sleep with your spouse, it's never the same. Come on, let's get honest. When you have sex with someone, it's never the same after that. You can pretend it's the same, but it is not the same. Lewis Smead says, you can't use your body to engage sexually with someone else's body and leave your souls parked outside. You can't do it. Your body and your soul are one. 
And when you engage sexually with someone, everything changes because you can't keep your soul on the side in order to feed the passions of your bodies. I mean, this is why magazines are, are helping, helping young women have unattached sex. So these are magazine articles. You can look it up. Probably don't, but <laughs> there are magazine articles that say, like, how do you have sexual relations with, with someone but not get attached? Well, why do they even have to talk about that? Because our bodies are designed to become attached when we have sex with someone. It is impossible to engage sexually with your body without something happening to your soul. Much of the time, that's hurt. Some of the time, it's hardness. Like you might say, I can sleep with someone and it doesn't really affect me. But let's ask the deeper question there. What is happening if you're doing the most intimate act that two people can do together and it doesn't affect you? What does that say about the hardness of your own soul? Man, we are not designed to be creatures that are separated body and soul. We are one. God has created our bodies with souls, and, and we cannot separate those two. We were meant to live life in the body. And our bodies matter so much to God. So much so that God has come to live in our bodies. God has come to live in our bodies where this movie Avatar presents Jake's moment of salvation when he finally gets to leave his body. The scriptures tell us that salvation is God coming to live in our body. God dwells in your body so that your body is now a holy place. It is a religious site. It is sacred ground. I don't know if you've ever been to somewhere in the world where there's like a temple or there is a religious place and you kind of walk in and you're like, this is something different. This is different. Paul tells us that our bodies are holy places on steroids because the God of the universe now dwells in us. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul goes on and says in verse 19, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought at a price, so glorify God with your body. Your body is not just part of you, it is the place where God dwells on earth. God doesn't live here in this building. This is just a building. God lives in you and me together, in our bodies, so that as we go out into the world, he is restoring us so that we can bear his image again in this world through our bodies. We are redeemed. We are showing the image of God. We are sharing who he is. And this should be the deepest sense of who we are as we think about our bodies. As we think about our bodies, uh, Vaughn Roberts tends to say that we think about them more like a pack of Legos. You know Legos, like you get them out and you can kind of make whatever you want. And we sort of think about our identity of our body that way. Like, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to work on my biceps. You know, I'm going to go to the tattoo parlor and I'm going to get a tattoo back here. <laughs> I'm going to go to the store and I'm going to get a clothes that fit me well. Like all these different things. And none of, I'm not saying any of those things are bad, but we tend to think of it that way. And what the Bible says, what Paul is getting at here, is your body is much more like a painting that is being restored by God. If you've ever seen a painting that has been let go or dust on it, you, you know you, with great care, you have to wipe it off and restore it so that it shows the glory it was meant to show. And Paul is saying that's what God is doing in our bodies. 
why he writes glorify God with our bodies, which is amazing because many of us have lived our lives not caring if we glorify God with our bodies. And it's not dependent on what we've done in the past with our bodies, but at this present moment, because God lives in our bodies, we have the opportunity to glorify him. Nothing can disqualify us if we know Jesus Christ. And so here's the beauty. God made your body. Jesus died for your body. And now the Holy Spirit of God lives in your body. As we ask the question, what does your body say about who you are? Ask those questions. But let's go deeper. What does God say about our bodies? And God says, it is my dwelling place because of what my son has done for you. I now live in you. I now am restoring your soul. And one day, I will resurrect your body from the dead. And you and I will live face to face with no more crying and no more pain and no more sin. The one who made our bodies, the one who who died for our bodies, the one who now lives in our bodies will one day restore our bodies and we will live with him forever. Let's pray. 